Bosch's paintings have lost none of their initial fascination. Thousands of museum visitors from all over the world constantly rediscover and admire the strange visual world of this unique painter. Motifs like the pale tree men in the garden of earthly delights and the hay wain are timeless cultural archetypes that have long been known far beyond the borders of Europe. Countless imitations and copies produced during the artist's lifetime and above all in the century after his death testify to the immense esteem in which this seemingly unconditional individualist was held. Together they make Bosch's visual world an astonished phenomenon of early modern art history. Curiosity about Bosch was at first governed by an interest in the fantastic that was rooted firmly in late medieval courtly tastes. Around the mid-16th century, however, the focus shifted to the interpretation of his work, an approach that has continued to dominate the artist's reception until our own time. Mm. Biography. Hieronymus Bosch, around about 1450 to 1516. Who will relate all the wonderful or peculiar fancies which Hieronymus Bosch had in his head and expressed with his brush of phantoms and monsters of hell, which are usually not so much kindly as ghastly to look upon? He was born in Hertgondebosch but I have not been able to discover at which time he lived or died, only that it was very early on. Hieronymus Bosch, Jeron van Aachen, belonged to a family of painters from the German city of Aachen, who moved to the Duchy of Gilders in the early 15th century. Hieronymus's great-grandfather, Thomas van Aachen, and Thomas's brother, Johann, worked as painters in Ninjmegen around 1400. Hieronymus's grandfather left this commercial center on the Lower Rhine in 1426 and settled in Hürtengenbosch in the Duchy of Brabant. He purchased a house in Vogelstraat where he set up his workshop and trained four of his sons in the craft of painting. One of them was Anthonus van Aken. 
Hieronymus Bosch's father, who later ran the workshop as a family business jointly with his three brothers. Anthonus bought a house on the east side of the town's main square, the Markt, in 1462. unhelpful to consider the historical circumstances of late medieval artists workshops by applying notions of artistic practice that essentially arose only in the 19th century. Artists in the late Middle Ages, and that includes Hieronymus Bosch, worked in workshops of varying sizes with assistants, apprentices and journeymen who were able to imitate the master's style and had access to his repertoire of visual inventions and motifs. Mm.
Bosch excelled in the subtle representation of his protagonist's emotions. A few brushstrokes were in general all he needed to articulate their feelings through distinctive gestures and postures. He used their individual facial features in much the same way to evoke sympathy, disgust or hatred on the part of the viewer. A young man and woman sit on the back of a gigantic duck in the midst of a huge flock of birds. They face each other, the man touching the woman's neck tenderly, and their faces are close together as if about to kiss. However, this is no conventional couple, as the woman is entirely black. Bosch might be playing with the idea of mismatched lovers who are nevertheless able to find one another in the earthly paradise. The female figure could also be intended as a wild woman. Wild women and men, also known as wild men of the forest, were described in medieval secular texts and were often used as heraldic supporters or shield bearers. They were powerful figures believed to live outside society, concerned only with their own needs. They were also seen as pure and uncorrupted by civilization. It seems natural to Bosch what a wild woman and an ordinary man could form a relationship in the earthly paradise.
The fool, clutching his staff and drinking from a bowl, sits on the branch of a tree trunk carried by the ship of fools. He is a skinny, hunched figure with long, spindly legs, dressed in a costume made of shiny material and a typical jester's cap with stylized donkey ears. Strips of fabric are with shells attached to his belt. Bosch's fool corresponds to the bizarrely dressed professional jesters of the late Middle Ages who either were employed at aristocratic courts or were travelling entertainers who pride their trade at annual fairs and similar events. Pellet with poisons in the vessel with pestle. The chalice from the palace has the true that is brew. Uh, brew that is true. Uh, the chessel with the palace. Uh, the palace with the... Look out! Hmm? It's a little crystal chalice with the figure of a palace. Does the chalice from the palace have the pellet with the poison? No, the pellet with the poisons and the vessel with the pestle. Oh, the pestle with the vessel. The vessel with the pestle. What about the palace from the chalice? Not the palace from the chalice. The chalice from the palace. Where's the pellet with the poison? In the vessel with the pestle. Don't you see the pellet with the poisons in the vessel with the pestle? The chalice from the palace has the bruise. It is true. So easy, I can say it. Well, then you find it. Hieronymus Bosch's paintings regularly include strange anthropomorphic figures that are either part human or part animal, or else made up of several different types of animal and then given a human character. Although Bosch is often cited as the inventor of the diableries in which these shimmerers appear, the scenes in question ought to be understood first and foremost in the light of pictorial traditions that stretch far back in to the Middle Ages. Similar hybrid monsters and fabulous creatures are found, for instance, in apotropaic demon repelling sculptures on the capitals of columns in the Romanesque churches and in the fearsome gargoyles, likewise intended to ward off evil, that spout water from beneath the caves of Gothic cathedrals. Bosch's contemporaries would also have encountered such monsters in hell scenes carved on church porches and in the Last Judgment paintings that adored courthouses in the Low Countries, not to mention the images of freaks and exotic creatures that illustrated world chronicles and single sheet woodcuts in the late Middle Ages and the early modern era. Shimmerers were also a heraldic element and appeared on many an aristocratic coat of arms or insignia. Yeah.
Antonio de Betis visited the Low Countries in 1517 as the private secretary of Cardinal Luigi di Aragona. While there, he saw a remarkable triptych at Count Henry III of Nassau's palace in Brussels. He wrote in his journal of various strange images with scenes of seas, skies, forests, fields and many other things. Some figures come out of a mussel shell, others crane birds, men and women and white and blacks in various actions and poses, birds and beasts of every kind and with such naturalism, things so charming and fantastic that it is impossible to describe them satisfactorily to someone who is not familiar with them. Debetus' description of the Garden of Earthly Delights, which was probably commissioned by the Count of Nassau, gives us an idea of how the artist's contemporaries viewed the work. They admired the immense variety of the strange and fantastical images, which they saw as original and entertaining. They were also fascinated by the artistry with which the painter was able to emulate nature. The painting is conceived as a triptych, the closed wings of which show the creation of the world in the form of a griselle sphere enclosing a disc-shaped earth. The open triptych follows the iconographical conventions of a last judgment scene with human beings and animals interacting in a bizarre panoramic landscape that unfolds across all three panels. The left wing shows the Garden of Eden, populated with exotic creatures. In the foreground is the creation of Eve. The carefree nature of humankind in the central panel gives way to scenes of sheer horror in the hell wing. Bestial monsters torment women and men alike, and musical instruments are turned into instruments of torture. The landscape of paradise becomes that of the apocalypse, which huge fires in the background laying waste to cities as a symbol of human civilization. The triptych came into the possession of William of Orange shortly after the death of Henry III of Nassau in 1538. It was confiscated in 1568 during the Duke of Alba's reign of terror and shipped to Spain where King Philip II acquired it in 1591 from the estate of one of Alba's illegitimate sons. The Spanish king had the triptych installed at the Escorial.